I never intended to play chess professionally. Okay. Uh, never took money targeted for that purpose. I was always set on a university career in academics doing mathematical research. And, uh, I do work in computational complexity theory, uh, which is known for the P versus NP problem, traveling salesman problem, maybe you've heard of. I have. Um, and uh, so actually did very little work in chess. So for two 10-year periods, so 86 to 96, when I got tenure, uh, the published parenting, and then the 10 years after that, then the toilet gate scandal happened in 2006. And Frederick Friedel said over the open chat line, uh, which I was on, is there anyone qualified to evaluate the kind of statistical allegations in Denilov's letter? And I realized that I was qualified. And I felt responsibility to uh, jump to the aid of the game. And uh, I worked up a qualitative model first and then a quantitative model. And okay. uh, well, so, and I can go into have that you, Has story. that model changed over time? I mean, this was your first foray. Has it, yes, have you it had time to fine tune it or has it needed it fine tuning? Its, it, it, it has had several updates, but it reached its uh, predictive analytic form by 2011, just in time for the Sebastian Feller case. You have obviously been involved with uh, a lot of the uh, anti-cheating work that's been done over the years, uh, starting with, I think, Topolov and uh, uh, and the Kramnik story, the toilet gate, you know, uh, I wouldn't say fiasco, but let's just say scandal. Um, and Sebastian Feller, as you well mentioned. Um, did you do a lot of work on the Sebastian Feller case? I actually followed up on that quite closely because I was good friends with uh, uh, Romain Dois, uh, who was really upset by this whole story. So just out of curiosity, what were your conclusions on the Sebastian Feller case? Uh, I could use Cyril Margelow's, uh confession as a public version, and I've been doing this since 2013. So, uh, so it was uh, a z-score well above the fide threshold on in marzalo's case the uh the four the four games that were featured in his confession uh the actual was based on privileged information private i'm doing the cell phone but this, the score is very similar so okay. it was it was and you could not get this conclusion by uh, using the entirety of the nine games. With the entirety of the nine games, it was just a 1.58 Z-score, not even above two. But so with, what, what, what is the Z-score, just, just to get yeah, that? Uh, okay, right. So Z-score is a, is a multiple of the standard deviation in a normal distribution. Okay. So um, if you're measuring something like concordance to an engine, it is an average over a set of data points, which are often assumed to be independent. They're not quite, but you can correct for that in this case. And since you're taking an average, something called the central limit theorem applies, which says with enough data, you converge to a normal distribution. Okay. And when you have the standard deviation of the normal distribution, you can associate what I call face value odds or face value unlikelihoods with points on that curve as a function of multiples of sigma. And there are many standard web apps. So let this be the first time I share my screen. And here is, this is one of many similar apps on the web. This one is maintained by the science writer, John Walker, who lives near Lausanne. Uh, and so you, type in a z-score, say I type 3.13 and calculate. And this says that the face value odds of being, there isn't a bell curve diagram here, unfortunately, uh, of being that much of the bell curve or to the right is uh, a little more than, a little longer than one in a thousand. Okay. okay. Is so that very phase. unusual? I mean, how how, yeah, how that, that would that would be fairly unusual, though. If you have several thousand chess players playing chess every weekend, you're going to see a few scores like this just because of the number of data points you have. Okay. Now, actually, there happens to be a nice bell curve diagram in this website that was featured on NPR this morning by uh, 
by the Porno Lies website of Clyde Weatherall. And uh, so here's an example where he's alleging that Neiman's website is on the uh, far side of the curve. And let's see now, it's her, hurt 8.021 mu. Mu is not the right symbol for sigma, but it looks to be, if I eyeball this, um, it looks the, uh, the sigma of the bell curve is here. So it looks like he's claiming that Neiman's performance is about 3.5 sigma, similar to what I just typed in, a little, okay. little longer. Okay, so that's the way that Z-scores and the bell curves are used. Okay. Um, so uh, if I type in 2.50, then what I call the face value odds are one in 160. If I type in 5.00, which is the scientific threshold for declaring something like the Higgs boson to have been discovered, that's 3.5 million to one face value odds. Yeah, now, so we're already starting the, getting into uh, lottery winning um, chances. Right. That's right. But if I put, I'll put back the, the this was the Z-score I actually had in Feller's case. Um, now, you have to uh, interpret further these face value odds in a Bayesian manner. So what I showed you up to now has been frequentist. Uh, you don't want to be one or the other. You want to marry the two, take the best. So what's the prior odds of cheating? Well, the prior odds of cheating, if you pick someone at random, is usually said to be about 10,000 to one against. I might shade it closer to 5,000 to one. But the main point is that um, if you have, if you take 10,000 people in tournaments and you have this kind of raw probability, then, Someone's going to get it at uh, inevitably, and it yeah. won't be cheating. It's just one of those right. you'll, you'll statistical. So you'll have nine false positives at this rate, and the one true cheater. So okay. you'll actually nine times out of ten, you'll hit the wrong guy. Okay. So this is so. After further consideration, this is not long enough odds. However, in the case of Sebastian Feller, there were observations. There were uh, there were attributes of the case that greatly narrowed down the field of comparison. Uh, so when there's other evidence, then it makes this, then the odds might be divided by 10 or by five or 10, but not by 10,000. Okay. And um, then that puts them within the range. Uh, so the of high of suspicion. arbitration for sport uses, recommends a threshold of comfortable satisfaction in uh, sporting cases. And my interpretation of that in chess is final odds between uh, one in a hundred and one in a thousand. For comparison, the United States decision desk headquarters for calling elections uses a 99.5% confidence threshold, which is 200 to one, one in 200 chance of error. Okay. And I think that's fairly well the sweet spot of what you should aim for. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so in in the case of in the case of Neiman, because I'm I'm sorry, it's just you brought up the that curve and you said and it looked like you were, it looked like you were already beginning to announce he's cheated. Look at this curve; he's on the other no, side. No, I'm going to rebut okay. that curve very strongly later. No, on. I, I I suspected as much. Otherwise, this would be a very short interview. <laughs> it was a good picture to hand. I forgot this website doesn't have a picture of the curve. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it was really interesting that you brought this up because. I am going to bring up a couple of other points before we actually hit your actual data crunching results. Okay. Um, and I would like to ask your opinion about, let's just say, using some of these other um, observations or, or other ways of, let's say, of trying to evaluate the uh, the, the the case of, of Hans Niemann, since that's the one that obviously everybody's focused on right now. Um, I have friends uh, who are respected players, um, and I don't mean people like Karo Nakamura, who obviously is very high profile with uh, his own, you know, uh, YouTube channel. But other friends who, you know, are respected, strong players uh, with titles and others. And 
some are in agreement. Some just say, well, look, we don't have evidence to this, that they're condemning him uh, without having access or even knowing about your particular uh, data crunching. Uh, so it's uh, absolutely unfair to try to yeah, uh, render judgment on him. And others say, look, I don't, I understand, but I don't need all that. I can already observe that after game three, his level started to fall drastically. Um, Small data. I'm, I'm just telling you the sort of conversations I have had with some people. Yeah. And I said, I don't think that that's really, you could, you could really make that kind of judgment on this. I've had tournaments where I collapsed after three rounds as well. Uh, and it didn't mean that I was cheating in my first three rounds. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there are other psychological factors that it came involved because of that third round. After the third round, when of course, Carlson left the tournament and everybody was sort of taken aback because nobody knew what was going on. Uh, and I can't imagine anybody was unaffected by it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it was just a huge shock. So, uh, you know, it, it, I'm just wondering how would, how, what would your comment be to someone who, you know, is a strong player who isn't going there, you know, innocently and who has these kinds of, uh, opinions based on these kinds of observations, what would you say to them? What would your opinion be? You said yeah, small so, data. So the first thing is, yes, the first thing is most important to say is that my system is set up so that all judgments are rendered based on evaluation of enormous size data sets. Okay, so, so tens of thousands of games by players of all rating levels. Okay. And in fact, I've even rejected some statistically potentially sharper methods because those would involve regression over the player's own small data. So I do not apply a minimization step to the player's own data. Uh, just, just count things up according to standards set by large data. I have generally found that when people make, you know, grandmaster interpretation and you know, chess positions, what is, what is a computer move, what is not, uh, I can more often or just as often find that this is contradicted by my quantitative method as sustained. Um, I'd have to dig into the past for some really good examples of this. Could you give uh, one? The, uh, yeah, of, of, of people saying, you know, certain moves are, are unbelievable. Although on James Altucher's podcast, we did look at the, a critical moment in the, in the, Car the Carlson-Niemann game where Niemann played the E3 move and showed that the chess engine uh, dithers a little bit back and forth between that and knight c4 as black's best move. Um, okay. So at any rate, as I said, I, I, uh, my system deliberately does not use specific chess knowledge. It's all based on the uh, quantitative data from the computer's evaluations of the moves transplanted into a utility function and then that's fed into a predictive analytic model that really works uh, in a broadly similar way to how economists you base predictive analytic models on utility functions. A small question for you, my friend. Um, yeah. It, would you uh, do the swings? I mean, this is something that just crossed my mind. Do the swings um, are the swings larger or more frequent for lower rated players than for higher rated players? Yes. Uh, actually, actually, noise below. Um, uh, for for players rated below 1600 continues to be a real concern in my model. And it's partly the reason why I have wider adjustment factors uh, beyond, that, beyond that point. In other words, I, I um, empirically adjust the, the uh, initial Z scores that I get to account for potential noise and skew and also for the lack of independence of chess modes. So I, I mentioned that yet to correct for that. Okay. Um, so um, I show, um, I don't know, so I, don't, I don't want to take this too far away from what you're saying, but I'll just say yes, for low rated players. Another issue is that is just the availability of data. So when I get it, uh, inputs from chess base, the ratings in those games for international tournaments are always FIDE ratings. But a lot of the games from, from of low rated players come from how chess base fills out up to 5,000 with local tournaments in Germany, the games they can get. 
And those tend to be German national ratings. And Werner Wolf, I think his name is, two years ago, did a study and wrote that the average German national rating is about 100 points deflated relative to FIDE. And from spot checks, I find that to be a greater deflation for ratings under 1500. So a lot of my data is this mix of, of uh, international and, and, and deflated German ratings. And, How did the uh, United that, States ratings uh, rate, the USCF Yeah, Yeah, that's, that's, that is something that I've measured. And the answer is, again, a, a very similar transition. We're below 1,500. Uh, it, it starts to get deflated. In the range between 1,200 and 2,000 actually is pretty good. And then famously, it's been well known for years that above 2,200, the USCF ratings are about 100 points inflated relative to FIDE. Okay. Um, so, um, and I, I have not taken time to analyze why that is. It's just something that I'm aware of when I'm using U.S. ratings to, for instance, um, uh, evaluate the um, U.S. Amateur Team East and tournaments like that. Okay. Um, so let's go to the elephant in the room as uh, has been coined over uh, off, uh, way too much. Um, the Hans Niemann case. Right. You mm -hmm. were called in to do this analysis or were you, did you just do this because you I, were I have, just curious? I have been doing, so let me actually say one more thing for backgrounds before we get into this. Please. Um, I have a two stage system, you know, on, on designed on purpose, the screening stage and then the full test stage. The screening stage is for rapid computation. I can often have a screening report within an hour of the last game finishing in a tournament. And in fact, I did that today for the World Cadets Championship in, in Batumi. Uh, and also for the, the Terra Finals in the UK, I had more of a delay. Um, but so this is this is like compiling a box score. So I, I don't know if you're a soccer fan, cricket fan, what sport I could use for the analogy. Um, but for instance, um, the screening stage, you know, counts the raw number of agreements with the engine and the, the total errors on moves that the engine does, doesn't like, and then compares those with coefficients derived from analyzing really hundreds of thousands of games, and then puts this on the normal scale, uh, the, the, uh, the bell curve scale, except I use the scale as scientists often do, of 100 coin flips with expectation 50 and standard deviation five. Okay, now what I'm, so you could, you, and you can judge soccer games. So if you have a soccer game, a football game that ends you know, five, three, that's a relatively high scoring game. And then you can decide, well, what were the, what my screening test doesn't tell you is whether the 5-3 score was obtained in a driving rainstorm uh, or whether it was a dry, sunny day where your people might be more likely to be able to maneuver the ball. So what my full test does is it judges the difficulty of the games. Okay, so, um, so I convey the screen, screen scores, your rapid deployment of, of large amounts of data, and you look at the high outliers and that gives arbiters instant information about whom to watch. Uh, and then if a further stage is needed, then we go to the full test, which takes a lot longer right? because it uses, a it uses the multi-PV playing mode of the engine and the analysis of each game takes four to eight hours instead of 15 minutes. So I have therefore, screening is easy for me to do. So I've been screening the grand chess door for six years now, regularly. So I was, so, so when uh, Carlson lost to Neiman, I submitted my report that evening, a, a few hours after the game. And, uh, you know, I had some comments to go with that report. But the uh, the screen scores on the whole remain normal for the whole tournament, and and I, and I will I have in fact a file where I have Neiman screen score after five rounds in, in the St. Field Cup because that was when I I took this file um, to show people. So 
Um, at any rate, so and I can and so um, I get that health picture. Now I am in public record uh, from the uh, press release of the tournament that the full test stage does not find any indication of cheating either. In fact, I feel I can say that you know, I, depending, I do tests of concordance to various engines and there are various combinations of games and moves. I can cherry pick uh, things. So depending on the combination that I get, I get C scores between 0 0.74 and 1.58. And all of those are in the completely normal range. Uh, <clears throat> so how how so what would be the range where you would let's say we would consider let's say and not necessarily a red flag but warning warning we're we're right. coming into the danger zone so there are two considerations and and yeah and this this you know we got into at the very start um so the question is whether there is other evidence okay observational or behavioral evidence such as a player getting up to go to the bathroom a lot perhaps indication of suspicious signaling, whether, you know, in a couple of cases, wires have been sticking out and, you know, maybe some doubt as to whether they were really observed. Uh, but has that actually um, happened or were you just conjecturing here? Oh, it's actually happened. Uh, this is Wires a public record of some of the cases I've Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. Oh, it's absolutely. nothing. That's yeah, just yeah. My, my normal antenna. It comes out of my shirt all the time. Yes, it says, I mean, well, you know, the... The uh, Ricciardi case in 2015 was a hidden camera in a necktie which through which an accomplice was viewing the game. And in the case of Ivan Tedimov, also in the public record, uh, there were wires observed. And uh, so so when there is other evidence, and, and also with Jens Kotaini, um, so when there is other evidence, then that's when the threshold of 2.50 applies. Because there are observations about the player that take him outside the hoi polloi of the several thousand players playing FIDE rated chess every weekend. Sure. So you have a lower comparison base. Uh, but if there is no other evidence, then you need a much higher threshold. And in fact, I'm not sure what the status is right now after the last day of the meetings at the Chennai Olympiad, but it has been FIDE policy that statistical reasoning may not be used for judgment alone for over the board chess it sounds like that's the famous story and, of are you going to believe me or your lying eyes well yeah so so that's but so <laughs> but if you but the threshold that was proposed for that for in-person chess is 5.0 okay. which happens to be the scientific standard for discovery but the main point is the face value are a 3.5 million to one if you divide by uh, upwards of a hundred thousand. Um, uh, let's see, a hundred divided by a hundred thousand would only get you thirty-five to one per year. Um, so maybe it's should close for over the board chess as opposed to online chess. Maybe it's closer to fifty thousand. That gets you toward a hundred to one um, odds. Okay. You know, you know, after after hashing things out. So that's the other, that's that's the reason why you need 5.0. Oh, yeah, am I doing this right away? 20 times six, yeah, that's right. Yeah, not quite 100 from, from 50,000 to one. Um, so, um, so in fact, actually, the way I put it is if you use this threshold, how many years would elapse between errors? Okay, something like the Dutch nurse case, although that was, um, uh, that was incorrectly that analyzed familiar. from the beginning. And um, so I think an error rate of one in 30, one in 40 years is acceptable. But the, uh, now for online chess, it's a different story for two reasons. One, the Bayesian prior is much higher. Okay, so one to 2% instead of one in uh, 10,000 or one in 5,000 uh, prior probability. But, uh, but uh, leavening that is the fact that there are so many more games played online. So therefore, there's much more opportunity for unusual performances to happen just by natural chance. Simply because of the volume of games being produced. The volume of games. I mean, the uh, so Littlewood's Law says that if you observe a million happenings, one of them will have a million to one uh, prior probability 
which is a common definition of a miracle. So, uh, so if you uh, see a million things a day, then a miracle happens every day. And in online chess, a million games per day is the norm. This is true. This is true, but not necessarily for one player. Right. Not as yeah, well. Yeah, but you have to say how does that player stand against the backdrop of other players? Now with Neiman, you get a further complication. He is in the world's top one hundred players. That is a more refined uh, data set for comparison. But even the top 100 players, at least online, play a lot. Yes. And Neiman especially has played a lot. Okay. Uh, have you? So that brings up a, a, a question that I was actually going to bring up. How uh, have, you, have, have you had the opportunity to analyze um, his online games as well? Yes. So in fact, actually, Rapid this, chess, this Blitz, now or is... Both, or? So this is uh, what I'm going to show you. So what you should see now is this is in my public area fidelity data. So what? So if you go, this is my public website. So everybody case, can access this. Everybody can access this. It's list. It's it's listed from my professional page. So this is if you just Google Regan Buffalo, you'll find my professional page as a professor of computer science engineering at the University of Buffalo. I have lots of things here. Uh, you know, my, my professional papers, my teaching, some creative writing, uh, my own chess site, especially with end games. Uh, but I have this Fidelity Chess Research site. So you click through that. That's this. This is my public page. Okay. Now, behind here, I have my private pages, but the data uh, extension is, uh, is, is public. So um, now, by the way, the main principle that explain the toilet gate anonymous is that if the games are very forcing and if the computer's moves are have much higher value than any other move, chances are a human player is going to find them as well as a computer. And this that's was how... actually my conclusion, actually watching Neiman versus Mamedyarov, actually. Okay. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, once they got past the opening, let's say at around move 17, um, I felt that it was the as uh, the player from Azerbaijan who was forcing the line. I mean, he kept pushing things that had that left uh, Neiman with very few options, really, other than to commit suicide or play the move that was the only way that wasn't going to commit suicide. And for about ten moves that happened. Then by the end of the ten moves, in which he had been basically been, you know, just responding to Mamedyarov's let's say um, uh, aggressive uh, uh, attempts, Mamedyarov was lost. And I just yeah. concluded, well, it wasn't so much Neiman who won the game as Mamedyarov who managed to lose it all by himself. Right. right. And that has been my conclusion in several other cases of this nature. Um, okay. But there, there was this, this was my conclusion, especially in the second game of the uh, topalov kramnik match, which I think is what upset the Bulgarians the most because Topalov should have won that game brilliantly. And then he ultimately lost it. And I do reproduce Kramnik matching the computer way over 80%. But my model actually also gives a very similar projection just because most of Kramnik's moves were, were um, forced. And uh, so, I, so, I, so I have a you know, full record of that. Um, so I, I'll just click it through for the moment. Sure. And uh, the, um, the key uh, item is um let's see this evidence here is this the key one let's see now it's uh let's see chess base here is now methodology data ah yes this is the key one here although it's 85 match match rate um in, in raw terms um so this um so the other thing is pretty random and in particular this was the key thing, because this was actually discussion that I had with someone who initially believed to Paulo's accusation. And the point is, when you remove the clearly forced moves, the few moves that were left over included two clear mistakes, four agreements with the engine, and five cases where there were multiple optimal moves. So this was just much of a muchness. So okay. I wrote this. <laughs> in October to 20, uh, 2006. And this 
of principle also comes into play in the Neiman Magnus games. This is my model reaching the, the similar conclusion that, that in that game, Black's play especially was very clear cut. However, what I want to show you pertains to your question about Neiman's other games. Right. So it's not actually linked, but I regard my data site as public. Um, and okay, well, actually, you see a blank page. So now let's type Neiman. And here we are. So as I just created this today, although I've circulated this privately for a week. So I have three main exhibits here. And I'm, as you see, I'm going to be contrasting Neiman and Igor's Rouses. So you asked me about online chess. So this is a record of my results of my weekly screening done continuously during the pandemic since, two, since, since January of 2000, in fact, 2020, in fact. Um, all my record of all the tournaments Neiman has played in. There, I think, are 106 data points here. And this includes, by the way, uh, I compiled this file five games into the Sinkfield Cup. So there's my screen for the Sinkfield Cup. I mean, he, he played a little, uh, you know, he was in trouble against Lanier Dominguez, Perez, but he still was undefeated at that point. And uh, so his screen score was 56, which, you know, 55 is one standard deviation up from 50. Okay. And uh, so this is, you know, in the normal range, and it's also smack in the middle of the Z scores that I later reported, uh, done with my full model. I said, this is just the screening, which does not take into account the difficulty of the games. It's a pure box score of, you know, which you could have in soccer. Now, there are, I think, 106 data points in this file, I, uh, and the median data point in this file is this one. 49.8 ROI, Serbian Team Championship Premier Division a year ago. Okay. Um, so in other words, this, this record is pretty well centered on 50. Okay. Now, this uses some, some of these events. So where they're online, the events use my uh, pandemic lag adjustment of his rating. But the in-person events in Europe that I get from my weekly screening, I don't apply that formula. So they are his FIDE rating at the time. Uh, incidentally, the uh, Coinbase tournaments have a lot of his lower scores. Um, so the the uh, chess.com rapid championship. Is that They're because of the time? Because remember that during this, let's say I can see some events dated from 2020 and others from 2022. Right. Uh, does and as is on as is well recorded, he has had a huge evolution you know, uh, in rating and presumably in chest strength right. over that period of two months. So it would actually not be very strange if two years ago his he was performing. Well, Coinbase was 50. this year though, April twenty twenty two, and I'm using his higher rating now. So there were two things about that evolution. So but let me just I'll, so I'll just finish with this, then I'll address this. So this is centered on fifty. Moreover. Um, 60 is my two sigma line, and to be above two sigma in the bell curve is a roughly one in 44 chance. I've got 106 data points, so divide 106 by 44, you expect two or three, and there are three above. There's also one below two sigma uh, over here in Coinbase, so that's really par for the course. And between uh, one sigma up and one sigma down, you should have 68% of the data points falling. And pretty much what I've highlighted is 68% of, you know, it's a little above and a little below. So this is very much a normal bell curve. That is about as normal as you can get. Um, if I take only as OTB tournaments, I get this smaller number of data points. The median of this is this, it's just slightly above 50, um, the uh, Sharjah Masters in May. Um, and the one thing I want to say is that is that fairly often, I only have seven games from a nine game tournament like the Vergani Cup. And that's because I don't have the games that were not broadcast, like in early rounds, he may not have been on a top board. Um, so, in particular, this 
record is biased toward broadcast games. Okay, so, but it's also still fairly normal. I have nothing two sigma down. I've got two, so one or two is what you'd expect from 50 odd. Have you been able to, have you been able to, um, let's say, within as much as possible, have you been able to, let's say, separate or compare um, your analysis from similar periods um, of games that were not broadcast with games that were broadcast? There was a well, tweet. I, I, was, I don't I'd just know. like to I mention. Mean, so, There's been a so, tweet that's been circulating yes, very recently. Yes, so the tweet that was circulated, so this, by the way, is the number one thing that I have been saying with Frederick Friedel and Chess Base all the time. Okay. So, uh, which is, you know, we have to stand for science. The tweet was circulated with none of the scientific um, requirements of commentary, of uh, comparison. Yeah, that that uh, that tweet, the chart in that tweet was picked apart by the U.S. master Todd Bryant, and that uh, was was uh, put on Facebook by Steve James. Uh, so it's not, it's not. But the information there was not accurate. For instance, some tournaments that were claimed to be broadcast only had three rounds broadcast in real time. So, uh, so there's a lot of ne necessary dotting of I's and crossing of T's okay. that people who are scientists know should be required. And you should not even talk about anything that does not meet that very basic level of standards. Uh, so it's, I, I have to I have to bring the point up because there is an audience out there who isn't necessarily going to be um, sticking uh, to just the most scientific rigor uh, possible and who will be there for like it or not asking questions based on things such as that tweet and right, that's I'd why like I need to, to get you at base. least to be able to address these comments uh, and say what's wrong with that data why should you not be listening to it why is it so fallible that it should be ignored completely. Well, that's the yeah, yeah, or 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 at least you should be attuned to listen for the rebuttal, and people just aren't online. I am, by the way, right now team teaching my department's freshman seminar on the internet and society, and uh, so several of my colleagues, as well as I, are devising units showing the fallibility of the internet and how one needs to read it. So. So that's that's the thing, but scientific method again. I would, uh, but I would love for chess base. Frederick's from Oxford, like I am, uh, so that that experience. So we know um, he's he's associated with scientists. So uh, so I think that would be a very great service to uh, to uh, stand for this. So um, so I have more controlling factors of this. Now let me show the contrast, and then I'm going to go into the issue of the rating upflow. Okay. okay, so this, so at the time of the Rouse's case uh, breaking, um, there were 24 observable tournaments. For some reason, I have only 19 in this file. This is a file that I compiled at the time. This is various versions of Stockfish because I pulled this. This is over a longer series of years, October 2014 through uh, summer 2019, when he was caught more or less red-handed. But the point of it, this, this, these are all, except for five, these were all the tournaments that were covered in chess space updates over the week in chess. And every single Z score, I'm oh, sorry, 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 every single ROI score is above 50. Okay. There are a lot of them are in the 40 to 60 normal range, but they're at the top of it. So this guy is doing above average with regularity. Now, numerically, it's a very similar situation. Over a slightly longer period of time, he rose from near 2,500 to nearly 2,700. Okay. And it's, it, he's confessed to cheating uh, uh, in part, and people believe that he cheated in, in small increments, so moderate cheating. But this shows up in my screening score. Every single one is above average. It's the Lake Wobegon effect, as it's called. All the children are above average. So that's a definite contrast. So the allegation against Neiman is that he might have been doing similar. But since the numbers and ELO levels are entirely similar, if that were the case, then I should be seeing something closer to this rather than something like this, which is absolutely entirely normal. 
or this with just the in-person chess. So, so the point is, I don't even see anything halfway to rouses. So you're saying that basically the curve that actually sits there going from, let's say, below to above um, throughout the entire cycle is actually a sign of healthy rating variation and right. performance rating variation. Right. As you may have heard, I don't know if you're, are you, are you, if you're aware about it, there, is, there was a declaration by Chess.com via their Twitter account, a message by Danny Ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, in which he justified their removal of Hans Niemann from their global chess championship uh, event uh, by saying that they had uncovered a series of other um, cheating instances. There's really no uh, other way to put it. Um, and they were waiting for uh, Hans Niemann to uh, explain this. Mm -hmm. I noticed. I bring this up because I noticed that in your list of the of events and whatever that you had actually um, uh, uncovered, that there was a number of events on Chess.com and so forth mentioned in the list of rapid events. And I was yeah. wondering if you had analyzed these and if you had actually flagged yes. anything unusual. And I have been dialoguing with Chess.com, and um, so the um, I, I you know. Not a liberty say it's it's what uh, you know there's 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 some right in both camps. Let's just say, uh, as as far as far as what chess.com said, and I said you know it's 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 their business, but I have made my data available, and uh, they can decide some of some of it. As you know, the statement uh, makes a point of saying also that uh, they are they do not believe that Hans Neiman has represented himself correctly. Uh, so it's so it's as much a question about the language of what Neiman said as the results, and I'll just say that that element is also relevant. So okay, so, that's, that's so you're privy to something that. about but something about something he said. When you say represented himself, it's not so much that he said he didn't cheat or did cheat. It's just let me say the the, the details of the story involving Chess.com. Right, that's right. So well, anyway, most yes. of the claims, the popular claims, is that the broadcast games are the ones that are the most suspicious because that would presumably be, uh, uh, let's say, facilitating the, the cheating elements. Yeah. If so, they weren't so what broadcast, I'm saying is, as, as justifying my, uh, my not needing to take the time to go individually each term and see which were broadcast, which were broadcast not, sure. as I'm saying is, if there's any bias in my data, it's toward broadcast games, and yet I show something entirely normal. Okay. So, so now, um, so, so the, the website Pawn the Lies by uh, oh, Weatherall, it's an, aha, about is, uh, what's the name, Caleb Weatherall, okay. um, claims to have simulated, based on the FIDE rating at the time and the ratings of the opponents, the expected number of points that Neiman should have. And they're claiming that his performance, which was 215 expected points, is, um, you know, it's 20, 20 points more than the lead, than the expectation of 195. And I guess I'm not sure whether these are meant to be sigmas. You know, this is, he writes mu, so I'm not, I, I, I have not, I only noticed this today, but it's in response to this that I, you know, decided to come out with my own data contradicting this. Um, now this, however, this is mathematically reasonable. This is your take his FIDE rating, apply the logic of the rating formula, which makes projections for the outcome of the games, uh, do random trials and take the averages of the trials. And he's saying that the true number of points Neiman scored is uh, you know, higher, significantly higher. I don't know how many sigmas higher um, than that. Now, what I'm doing instead is I'm looking at the intrinsic quality of the move. So I'm closer. I'm using data that's more direct. And one thing important is I'm not doing data at the unit of games and the point scored. I'm doing data at the level of thousands of moves. So I have a lot more data. Um, now, the, the, the poster child data point to tell you what's what uh, to express this contrast is my screening score with Stockfish 11 
for the Havana Kappa Memorial, which Neiman won with 7.5 out of 9. And this has been alleged as one of his suspicious tournaments. Okay, so he scored 7.5 out of 9, more than expected, but my screening score for him is below the expectation of 50. Okay. So what does that mean, the screening score? Ah, so this is my ROI, Raw Outlier Index Screening Score, which is mapped to the coin flip distribution where 50 heads out of 100 coin flips is the expectation and the standard deviation is five. Okay. So you're saying that he actually underperformed? Yes, he underperformed in, in raw accuracy terms relative to the Stockfish 11 engine. I've also taken this with respect to Komodo 13.3, and actually I've uh, done some of this, uh, these terms have done with the latest engines as well. So not just, much just, just to see if, I under, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, yeah. um, based on computer uh, analysis of the moves, based on the, the formula you've, you've applied, mm -hmm. he, in terms of the accuracy of his moves relative to his result, he actually should have scored higher. And yes. if there is a, a red flag, or let's say a flag that's causing this uh, a very unusually high score of 7.5, which people are, uh, you know, screaming bloody murder about, it's his opponents who obviously have made even more egregious mistakes to achieve that. Yeah, possibly. Yes. In fact, actually, that I should a, check that. So the other data point is Sigmund because he won that tournament too, and okay. there he is above 50 percent, but less than one sigma above. Okay, so, um, so that's how so, many sigmas so, above would you be worried about? Uh, well, from screening, a normal uh, yeah. in a normal case, just casually. Yeah, 70. 70 is my red line. Um, and, and okay. so fifty three is way Amber. down there then. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, that's it. He, these are the only scores. Now, I mean, there has been comment on his GM norm at the Charlotte. Uh, uh, to October 2020. I think Andre Poonin uh, addressed this, and uh, I haven't actually listened, had time to listen to Andre Poonin's video yet. I think there's one in Ukrainian, but maybe there's one in English too. Um, so so this, this, however, though, I have lower screening scores with the other engines, and I did do the full test on this, and, and the full test scores are lower. So I mean, that just happens, there's normal scientific variation. But this anyway is not in the red zone or even in my amber alert zone, which is 65. Okay. So this is just somebody playing well. And right. it's the playing well out of 50 chances to play well that's likely to happen. Now, actually, let me um, unshare for a moment. And you just suggested something that I can add to my website. Uh, so let me, in fact, do that. I can add my screening files of the Havana and Sigmund tournaments. I think those are fair game for the public. So let me uh, just uh, do that here. Um, okay. So Havana mm -hmm. star 2022. I was telling a friend um, that who was uh, <clears throat> uh, commenting on the, the, uh, the rating evaluation. I said, look, I uh -huh. can't speak for it. I mean, he's a young player who's been growing enormously, and I would estimate that it's pretty natural even to have some, uh, a certain degree of inconsistency regardless of natural uh, uh, statistical uh, variance. I know that when I first made my breakthrough, I uh, I jumped 350 ELO in a, in a single ratings list. Yes, uh, and so did I. But, um, yeah, and, and it was like I was 1880, and suddenly I was 2230, Fide. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I said, look, I would love to say that I was a consistent 2230 player, but I never knew who was going to appear at the board one day or the next for at least a year. Um, one day I'd be playing like a complete idiot and another like a genius, you know. It yeah. And that is a factor that I admit I haven't necessarily comped completely in the, you know, in the two weeks since this came up or, or more generally. So I myself, actually, I had two and a half years of stagnating at in the 2200s, low 2200s. And then I played in a tournament over Thanksgiving uh, 1975, and I defeated Walter Brown in round two, defeated Mark Deason in round three, drew with Sal Matera in round four, drew with Pal Banco in round five, and, or maybe vice versa. 
And yeah, this was only with Fritz Seven you, you, helping you. And that I that and then uh, Art Bisquire ground me down with two bishops against Bishop and Knight and a hundred moves in round six. So I didn't win a prize, but I did win 160 rating points, and that qualified me to be on the U.S. student team in 1976. Okay. Uh, so and there but there have been cases where. I have regarded this mercuriality of suddenly having very good results as indications of promise. Um, so I want to show one more example out of the last bit of data that I've that I've teed up to show. And this actually also came up in, in the previous uh, example, and that is the meteoric rise of Fabiano Caruana. So I'll show it just to my browser. So again, this is a possibly relevant point of comparison with Niemeyer. Uh, from the 2000, January 2006 rating list, he was only 2409. And then by October 20, 2007, less than two years, he had shot up 200 rating points. Now, if you want to use exactly the Niemeyer numbers, um, in October 2006, he's 2474. And then he hits 2,700 by July 2010. So that's a little bit longer period of time. But in fact, in uh, a year earlier in late 2009, so exactly the same time frame, he's already up to 2,652. In fact, I made actually said. a similar comparison 20 in terms of, let's say, late bloomers, because young children or young players at a certain degree, this is actually fairly standard, uh, with Levin Aronian, who at the age of 21, um, was a little over twenty was twenty five eighty or something, and uh, he was no. There's nothing to you know to say. Oh my gosh, this guy is going to be incredible. And three years later, he's the number three player in the world. So it's that. So that's actually a, another thing about general science appreciation that there is a lot of variety of data points, and that it that you cannot cherry pick things. That's one thing that chess players do all the time. Uh, so um, that's one reason, in fact, why I'm generally very guarded with my data, because people might cherry pick my high outliers. If I've got uh, 750 players, one of them's going to be top in my list. And if you were just quartiling, then you would say that guy's a three sigma outlier, because three sigma is just under 750, one in 750 natural frequency. So, um, but people cherry pick on Facebook all the time, like, you know, cases of vaccines going badly for people. Um, so, maybe. so did you, so let me get back to it. Have you flagged anything unusual for, cause I'm, I'm just, I understand that your overall data says that there's nothing to, 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 um, to condemn Hans Niemann's, uh, his performances sure. as cheating. There are two things that still, that I'm, still nagging me regarding all of this and not your, 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 your results. The first is you've mentioned that Pon Elias has uh, made data that, uh, with some reasonable means, but his data obviously has achieved, has reached some very different, um, conclusions. This is simply because he's using less information or is there something fallible in the methodology that he's using? Why is well, there such a discrepancy? A question, and it's really, um, it's really a question of, um, you know, of, of what are you looking for and whether there are possible systematic explanations for um, for things. So in fact, let me now- One thing we'll that just came to me, just out of well, at least when I was looking at this, because what I understood really? is that he's basically analyzed it relative to the rating of the player at the time. He's rated, I don't know, 2,500, and he yeah. outperformed it by so many points. Right. Now, if he's actually growing as fast as he is, then every time he actually is performing, then of course his rating will be lower than what he's actually worth. Right. So that's true. And someone, you know, taking the time, which I don't have uh, at the moment, to do the perspiration work, to do the grunt work, should go through, he should publish his list of what ratings he used at the time. Okay. And you should compare that with my ratings where some of them, the online ones all do have my um, pandemic lag adjustment, but a lot of these in-person chess ones don't. And some of these might be like, this might be a USCF rating though, like whatever, whatever came in the file, because I, you know, I did this on mass without 
knowing that Hans Niemann was going to be a major case in December 2020. Of course. So, um, so you should do that kind of in-depth comparison to see if uh, the nature of the contradiction, if there really is one. However, what I've just done is I've added a lot more stuff to my page. So let's now look with Stockfish 15. Uh, here we go, Stockfish 15 at the Havana Kappa map. And let's look at Neiman versus his opponents. And let's see if he scored points more because his opponents played badly than because he played well. Um, now, let's see, the average rating in the tournament is 2589, you know, by, or, or by game 2589. So Neiman, a little bit above the media in their fields, but not, not a lot of difference. Um, so now, this, with respect to Stockfish 15, Neiman's ROI was right on the button, you know, the expectation um, uh, button. Now, is so he matched the computer 59.5%. This is a term he won, right? In the term he won. He matched Stockfish 15 a little higher, but also his error was a little higher, although it's among the lowest error of this group. The, the Yilmaz had a lower error. Uh, also lower first move match and a slightly higher ROI. In fact, he has the highest ROI with his even score. But the ROI thing is really tightly bunched around 50. Um, I don't compute an ROI from the average of the opponent's ratings. I could, and my full test thing could do similar. But the number that stands out to me here, though, is that this error figure, 0.152, this is my scaled version of average sent upon loss. And this is notably higher than the other figures. There's one that's close to it. So Luis Casada Perez had a fair bit of luck from his opponents, but Neiman's opponents played clearly the worst. Okay, so, so basically it's not so much Neiman who's, what you're saying is that Neiman's um, accuracy wasn't standoutish in any way. It was, what stood out mostly was how poorly his opponents were playing against him. So that and that and that often happens. You know, I don't want to take things away from people, but in famous no, cases, this is where just numbers. A twenty-two hundred player has beaten several high GMs. The reason is that the high GM didn't play like a high GM. Actually, here's one case. So I did intrinsically rate the Deep Blue versus Kasparov matches, oh. and this is in a paper published and invited for the. Uh, Springer Verlag Lecture Notes in Computer Science, 10,000 issue anniversary, so prestigious issue. And I measured Deep Blue playing in the mid 2800s and Kasparov playing under 2600 for both matches combined. Okay. So, so Kasparov didn't play at Kasparov's level. Uh, um, Could this be because he was adjusting his play to the engine? Uh, or it could be that he went on tilt, especially in the last game. No, uh, the last so, game, of course, is 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 a special case. But um, yeah. if you look at the first game, some of the games that he played, let's say against Deep Thought before maybe yeah. Deep Blue, um, there was definitely some anti-computer strategy involved. And this, right. of course, a, a normal engine might say, "Oh, he's playing much. He's playing much worse." Yeah. But this might have been suited against his opponent. I start with turn nine. So I don't do turns. So anti-computer strategy in turns one to eight will be ignored. But uh, but from turn nine onward, yeah. Um, so anyway, let's see if that's also the case in Sigma. Uh, let's see. Here's we'll say. Do you want Komodo thirteen point three? Let's do that. Uh, so whatever okay. you feel is adequate. They're also strong. I can't imagine it makes much of a difference. People will sit there cherry picking right. some microscopic move, but it's like, yeah, this guy has this one is actually ten elo worse at three thousand nine hundred and ten. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so here, Neiman did well. He was one sigma up at fifty five. Uh, the, you know, my Irish determinant is pretty much spot on. Um, and let's see, his opponents. Uh, had average that his opponents actually matched the computer fairly fairly well. Um, let's see, this was oh, this is twenty seven hundred ranked tournament. Okay, I didn't realize this tournament was so high. Wow. Okay, and zero point zero six one average set upon loss was second highest. Uh, Arjun era Gaizi, but you could credit, you could say he induced his opponents to make errors, but everyone else had opponents playing. You know. Um, 
okay, slightly lower in the case of David Navarra and Salem Sale, but you know, noticeably lower for Alexei Shirov and Jordan Van Ferres. So again, you know, slight um uh, but noticeable effect of the opponents. Now, maybe Neiman has this kind of meddlesome style that plays more challenging game that induces errors from the opponent. I have a version of my model that tries to detect this phenomenon, but it's it's very delicate. Um, I would so. imagine two players that uh, that managed this would be Gary Kasparov and uh, Mikhail Tal, actually. Yeah, actually, it should be Alexei Shirov normally, and Tal certainly. So one of the things I lecture on is my um, comparison between Karpov and Tal at the 1979 um, uh, Tournament of Stars in Montreal. So I should also say, by the <laughs> way, from going to my um, professional website, okay, let's just Google Regan Buffalo and find it again. Um, I have a very um, uh, disorganized but public record of all the lecture talks I've ever given. And one of them is my talk to the FIDE Congress. Actually, let's do the no pauses version. Um, and let's see, I can uh, increase it a little bit. So uh, so I have the example that Karpov and Tal co won Montreal 1979 with 12 six scores. Tal matched the computer the most. Karpov matched the computer Ribka three in this case, uh, the least by a 2% margin. But because of the nature of the games they play, Tal plays more tactical forcing games. My program gave a projection that Karpov would match only 51% and a projection that Tal would match 57%. So it matters in how tactical the games are. Okay. Um, and, you know, Le Quang Gem had 70% matching in Aeroflot 2012 one of the early times I was screening a tournament uh, in, in real time. And, but when I did the full test, um, he actually uh, was projected to match above 60%, which is unusual. And he had a strong minus score in the tournament. It's just live by the sword, die by the sword. And I was a tactical player. And in fact, in the entire series of famous Lone Pine tournaments, my matching to Ripka in 1977 is uh, tied for third with Kennedy Sosanko, with two non-grandmasters, including, in fact, a mathematician, ahead of us. So clearly in 1977, I was cheating with Ripka using time travel implants. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, it's just because I was <laughs> no, a very I tactical player. That's why I joked in the, when you started talking about your, your 77 result. Yeah, you're using... Fritz eight seven because obviously you know eight. yeah yeah um, whatever so and I and I did well I I I um, defeated Laszlo Sabo in the last round I had five and a half out of nine I was tied with or ahead of six U.S. champions who were in the event so um, but um, but anyway so as I said these this my model does pick up enough of this style difference the screening does not allow for that but the full test does. And one of the things I did is using the um, version of my model that upweights positions that are critical, where there's more likelihood of a sent upon loss by the player to move. Um, the Can third you predict highest, that? right? Can you predict that? Uh, well, yeah, so I, so, I, so I set my model uh, with this alternate setting I call expectation weights normalized trying to be like alpha zero. Um, but uh, the, the problem with it is it might be better at detecting smart cheating by an actual smart cheater, cheater. But with online chess in the pandemic, there was a lot of not smart cheating. And in that case, clumping the distribution increases the baseline sigma and actually lowers the sharpness of the model. Uh, so, so it might be better for a person who cheats only in critical positions, but for the main, uh, you know, every move engine cheater, it was actually worse. Okay. Um, nevertheless, I was very gratified. So, um, because 
so I did this was for the Isle of Man tournament in 2019. And this uh, and and um so uh, and I should say that the theory of this is in another article on this on this computing blog. Um so let me get that up called predicting chess and horses, where I uh, analogize. So the so the first thing I'll say about my model is I'm the only one doing full predictive analytics. Okay, so putting uh, you know at the level the same level of an insurance company that would put probabilities on damage from fire or water or wind based on the rating of the neighborhood where the house is built. Okay. Um, uh, you know, is it on a floodplain, for instance? And um, so you could, my model is what you should use if they're, you're doing real-time betting on moves in chess games, if you can get its results quickly enough, um, I have to say. Anyway, so this is the fruit of my effort, which I finally settled in uh, in summer 2019 to project non-optimal moves. To, to project traps and really try to address the, the question of what makes a lower rated chess player. Do they innately prefer weaker moves or are they diverted by moves that look good? So this is a, this is a um, controlled experiment where I took 6,000 games in my training, 6,000 positions in my training set from games by players rated 1,000 to 1,200, okay? So this is the chess version of crowdsourcing the number of jelly beans in a jar. So these weak players nevertheless find the computer's best move 17.76% of the time, a 4.5 percentage point plurality over the next best move. So you could take their plurality vote and get the best move in the position more often than not. And of course, because they're weak players, they'll play a move out of the top 10, 25% of the time. But on the whole, they have enough chess sense that average over a lot of them. They they certainly can distinguish between the best move and the 10th best move, even though it's less than a quarter pawn worse. Okay. So what makes, so for predicting inferior moves, this is what gave my model a little bit of an upgrade in power, is the theory that weaker players are more likely to be diverted by shiny objects, by moves that look good at low depth. And you need a lot of information from the computer to be able to see, well, if you're cheating and you have that information um, handed to you on a platter, then you've gained a lot in terms of, of difficulty in the position. Right. That's what I'm trying to measure. So now with that measurement at the Isle of Man tournament, the top three players in terms of creating difficulties for their opponents were Pentala Hara Krishna, Marie Seabag, and Alexei Shirov. So, and I colored those, those figures orange in honor of fire on board. Okay. okay. So, so this, this, this is my harder uh, to control version of David Spurton's fighting chess index, which I think is a much better thing to use in a tournament because the players will understand it better. And I think it's been uh, highly effective. I noticed it making a difference in my screening scores. Uh, there's a long story behind that because um, uh, it changes the way people play, you know, especially in the prelims of the online tournaments. Um, so, uh, more power to that, but when I say difficult to control, there's something at the bottom that I want to put out for the science. So this was the Sinkfield cup in 2019, a critical game in Anand versus Wesley. So, and it's a very interesting position where, um, at low depth, the engine thinks that queen f3 is the best move. And it's a very attractive move. It keeps the game in the center. You're threatening to go to h5, hitting the rook and the pawn on h7. Is this show? This is showing, right? Yeah. Okay. 
It turns out, though, that the winning move is to pull the queen back to F1. But that fact emerges only at higher depth, especially with the non-Stockfish uh, 10 engines. Okay. okay. Um, now, so the question is, how much weight should I put on queen F3 for prediction? So I have a parameter in my full test model. It's called the gradient that influences how much weight I give. It's a hyperparameter, meaning I have to set it in advance before I do the parameters that refer to the nature of a player's play. So if I use 2.5 for that parameter, then actually my model still predicts queen F1, which was the best move with way too high a probability. But I still gain a little bit of prediction gain over a model that would completely say, put all the probability on queen F1. Okay, so I gained 2.5. Three percentage points of prediction gain for 25, 750 plus players. And that's substantial. That's more than half a sigma when it comes to Z scores. Now, if I lower the gradient, it means giving a little more weight to the lower depth moves. So at 2.0%, I uh, Queen F1 is still the best move, but Queen F3 went up a little. 1.5%. Uh, now Queen F1 is at least it's you know it's well under 50%. When I put it at 1.0%, now the move that Anand played is actually the one my model gives clearly the highest probability to. So if I want to set my model to maximize predictivity, this is what I should do. But there's something else going on in this picture. What's going on in this pic picture is the conformance of my main model parameters to ELO rating. And you see that with 2.5%, there's a really nice linear, especially of my sensitivity parameter, that's the red, and of my consistency parameter, which is your measure of avoiding mistakes in tactical positions. Uh, pretty well good linear. Now, when I put the gradient here, the still pretty good linear conformance, although this is rounded over a little. It's only up to 0 0.16 instead of 0 0.18. Here, however, though, things have begun to collapse. This is under 0 0.14. This is starting to flatline. And this, it's a little less obvious, but what's happened here at 1.0 is that my sensitivity parameter has collapsed to zero. And my consistency parameters totally flatlined. So this in, in this state, my model is not robust and stable. Uh, it would be, it could misbehave if there were a little bit of mission creep in what it was being used for. So one fact that so I think this is a problem with data science on the whole is that models are built to address a problem but they're not built to address the large space of possible nearby problems and not tested for the robustness of their determinations. So I've put a lot of effort, even at the cost of making my model a little blunter, to making sure that it is robust in terms of horse sense. Okay. So, so this is an element of data science that is very important for science that I don't even think professional data scientists pay enough attention to, but certainly let alone the people who post things on Twitter in the chess world. Well, that's okay. about so, me. <laughs> so, so that's, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, that's, that's, that's getting on my, uh, my, uh, you know, stool in Hyde Park. And by the way, when I talk about this blog, this is a recent comment by Gil Kawai. He's a famous Israeli mathematician. Mm -hmm. He's co-author of a paper that Frederick especially would love the uh, the paper that rebutted the book the Bible Code, okay. Uh, he's and he's a skeptic of quantum computing. I ten years ago I moderated a debate by him and the I, the MIT professor Aram Harrow of the Harrow Hasidim Lloyd HHL algorithm on which a lot of quantum machine learning is is predicated. Okay. Okay. So that's what I said. It's a kind of this is a Hungarian mathematician. Uh, this is a, a logician. Um, so we get these, uh, you know, these, these comments from, you know, fairly high people on this blog. Okay.
Um, and, and I referred to Cali in my in the podcast with James Altiger too, but I didn't share my screen, so I wanted to do that. Okay, so that's uh, so you've let me talk a long time. Now you can ask me more questions. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> um, okay, so the first the first thing you have to say is basically is that Hans Niemann, there's nothing. St- very that stands out not even in a slightly uh unusual way about Hans Niemann's results or over the board chess right right what about the online well since august 20 20- analyst i assume let's say i could vouch for him and i don't think that since would be august what sorry other people's opinions uh, the difference of opinions are before that date from what um, date sorry august 2020 Okay, Late so for, as of August 2020, 2020 to today. Say. Yeah, September 2020 to today. Uh, I mean, this is in accord with what Neiman said, that it was there was early in the pandemic. Right. Uh, that, that, uh, so, um, so as you see from the data points that I had, so, so I, I began doing Title Tuesdays in mid-2020, 2021, when Mark Crowther was able to uh, uh, assemble a complete index of the FIDE identities of people in the 2020. So then Mark sends a version with the real names and with the FIDE IDs. So that, that can index my work to the FIDE standard rating and my adjustment of it. So okay. my data points for Hans Niemann are all from that mid-2021 date onward. And I, did, I guess I've been- How many games the- were there roughly? Oh, the typical title Tuesday, whether it's split in two sections or not, give, gives you between 2,500 and 3,000 games. Okay, so, yeah. So, pretty substantial. And I had run the chess.com files too, but to the chess.com's ratings are highly inflated. Sure. So It's I, not I, so I, much, right. I mean, I understand that for me, ratings is always a relative thing. I mean, uh, yes, if my rating online is 3,300 compared to my a FIDE rating of 2300 or whatever, um, it just, I will just assume that most players, if uh, they all perform on a similar level in rapid chess compared to their standard chess, which is not necessarily the case, um, you just shake, take off a thousand points because these are different rating tools after all. Right. See, in games, only the relative rating matters. But I have to interpret the rating system on an absolute scale. Okay. And one of my published results in a paper with Bartek Machea and Guy Howarth uh, 11 years ago, late Guy Howarth, is that the FIDE rating system has remained markedly, remarkably stable, that there has not been a huge amount of rating inflation. There are some inflation that can be explained by the faster time control and lack of uh, adjournments relative to quality, but actually it's the, the tide's been reversing since 2010. Uh, there's actually been deflation relative to my quality measure. So it's pretty much canceled out at this point. So just for chess.com, I mean, do you have separate data um, analyzing his results in uh, chess.com? Well, yeah, but and use, but using the FIDE standard rating. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of that was in the file that I showed. And your conclusions are? That uh, at least since September 2020, no evidence of any cheating. That's pretty uh, and really well. My my full date it starts in June twenty twenty one. So, um, okay. So if there anybody was like concerned, let's say from the time that he uh, seventeen, because we already he's said that yes, I um, in uh, non tournaments, non conditions, I cheated when I was sixteen, and now he's nineteen. So yeah. twenty twenty would be when he was seventeen, and presumably he said, "Oh, I'm clean," and yeah. you're basically saying it's true. Well, yeah, now there's something that needs to be said that I probably should have said at the very beginning when we Please. first started talking about online platforms. Online platforms avail a lot more information than I do. My, my work is really minimalist. In fact, I don't even involve the amount of time a player had left simply because I can't get uh, rely, reliably large amounts of training data with that. Chess base does not include that statistic in the updates. The weekend chess does not either. It's not for games that are not broadcast. It's not recorded anyway. And even when they were broadcast early on, sometimes that was unreliable. Uh, so 
Uh, so I could, however, though, try and update my model with the clock time showing on games posted at chess24 and chess.com when you click the include clock times option. Um, and that might improve my, the sharpness of my model, but because I don't have the massive comparison set of data, or at least because I didn't five or so years ago, I haven't done it. So, um, so there are other veins through that where online platforms acquire information through the interface. Okay, and then there's you know, there's other modes of observation when players are playing on Zoom cameras uh, or invigilated in hybrid chess, and I just don't overlap with that. So, uh, so therefore, that enables an online platform to get a much stronger determination. Um, nevertheless, what I can do is, in a case where a player is, was sanctioned on an online platform, completely as a result of a tournament. So especially when a player had not even played any online chess prior to signing up for this online tournament, and the online platform made a sanction, may disqualify the player, then I can compute my z-score using just my minimalist method. And then the average z-score that I get from these cases gives me an idea of how strong my methods are relative to the platforms. Um, you know, guessing maybe that the platform uses a five sigma standard. So I might get 3.5, okay, from a case like that. And that by itself would not be enough to disqualify a player. So that's, that's why I'm coming into this from saying that, you know, my results agree, but with this caveat. So my 3.5 not maybe not strong enough. Um, Was when that the case of Neiman? Was no he a 3.5? What? Well, was no, that no he wasn't anywhere near that. But I'm saying, you know, in general. But if the platform has a 3.5 equivalent, whatever statistical metric they use, completely from their completely from their independently gathered interface data, then you add up those 3.5s, so you get seven, and you divide by root two because that's how z scores add. They're like logarithms. And now you've got something near five. And so the combination of those two is enough to make a disqualification. And of course, online chess sites do that in hacks. So, right. So, but at the same I, time, yep. they may not be using the same level of um, move analysis. Yes, they might have other things that they can include in their analysis, but they may not necessarily yeah. be using the same level of per move computational analysis that you have. Right. So now the point is, I can judge the component of their cheating detection that overlaps with mine. Okay. And, you know, if I get enough data points, and it's just gut feel, I could maybe make it scientific, but um, I will say that uh, just from my reflection, both chess.com and Lee Chess have raised their, have sharpened their cheating detection over the past two years by at least half a second in my terms, from what I've been observing. Meaning... So more power to them. Meaning that they're being more efficient and more aggressive? Yeah, or just assuming they're using the same standards, their tests are sharper. So okay. so there's, you know, so there's, there's um, you know, less prone to false negatives. So you want a test to be safe, that's what that's uh, avoiding false positives, and you also wanted to be. Let's see, what's this? I'm forgetting the. Have you ever the had the case one. where you had to do the opposite, where someone was wrongly, and I don't mean here, how's it, man, uh, accused of, let's say, wrongdoing? You know, our systems have concluded concluded that he's absolutely cheating, or she, uh, and that your analysis debunked. Well, yeah, I mean, there have been times when. Uh, I have not supported it in action. So, um, you know, that happens. And uh, so there, 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 are, there are some unresolved, you know, I communicate with, with all the platforms. I don't want to 
jeopardize my my very good communication with them. No, no, no. I wasn't yeah. suggesting that you yeah. start to point fingers and say, "Who? Come on, tell us." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm just trying to understand to see, you know, how fallible or reliable these systems are because obviously I understand that you're trying to do your best, but doing your best is not a hundred percent case. And as you've mentioned, even they don't yeah. have hundred percent. And there's so one thing that also been... needs to, needs to be understood. Okay, so an error by a platform is itself a an event subject to sickness. So when you, uh, so this actually is one of the points of a post I made called the doomsday argument in chess uh, two years ago. So chess.com has made a number of sanctions in around, you know, 200,000, I think more, probably a lot more than that by now. The last published source I had, it was between 100,000 and 200,000 a couple of years ago. So when you make that many actions, there are going to be a few errors. And the people where the error was made are going to squawk about it, actually will protest about it. And those are the cases that you will see talked about. So you will get a distorted picture of their error rate because of this natural shiny marble or cherry picking thing that happens. And again, a lot of, lot of what communications on Twitter and Facebook need to be filtered through this lens. So, so online sites, you know, every 30,000 uh, rulings by chess.com, including auto bans, uh, they will make a four sigma error uh, relative to their own performance. And you know, that happens, it's, it's part of the cost of, of uh, the needed policing to, to keep things safe for people on the whole. Um, so however, since those cases tend to become public, they're the ones that maybe I'm called in so I, you know, so I, so I might get a, 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 something that indicates more that this was maybe an error. And chess.com is really actually bends over backwards to try to correct possible errors. So, so they err more on the side of caution to, from what I observe. Okay, okay. So right now, uh, the general, the safe, uh, uh, comment is to say is that Hans Lehmann may have uh, issues with chess.com right now, um, but, or at least, you know, based on the recent, uh, issue, the very public uh, uh, declarations on both sides, but it's not necessarily because Hans Lehmann was actually cheating, more of just, you know, what each one is saying about how things happened and what, th what happened. Yeah, a combination. Very political, eh? <laughs> yes, but, but also accurate. I mean, I, I'm I'm telling I, I am not sacrificing accuracy. I'm just not telling you. To, no, no, I don't actually to to to, to, yeah. to tell so, to tell stories. I, I was just trying to because right now I'm mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in because that's what everybody knows you to, to be an expert in is the computer analysis of the moves, statistical data, uh, and you know what what did your let's say uh, vast data crunching show regarding yeah. him mm -hmm. because we have opinions flying left and right he's talking too loud he doesn't think straight uh, you notice how he moves his hands uh yeah. his voice wavers when he says the queen you know or, or whatever you know and, and everything turns out to be pointed as proof of his innocence or or, or guilt and <laughs> you start wondering well, okay well <laughs> where's the real data that i can actually use because all of this sounds you know like uh uh, like a seance uh, with everybody holding their hands and close your eyes and I feel yeah. spirits in here. So I've got uh, lots of data, but I have to guard very carefully against the reality that the same people might want to interpret it as seance. So if they don't, if they, if they're not schooled in scientific moderation, then people cherry picking from my data will lose the context in which the value of my work resides. So the fact that I have you know, I, I have taken just during the pandemic, I've taken almost 300,000 tests of players playing in tournaments. So it's great that we finally meet and talk about things. Yeah. The, oh, I can't. I've, I've really, I've really loved it. I mean, um, it was uh, far, far larger and greater than I ever expected. Uh, you're extremely generous in the, uh, your your willingness to try to impart as much information as possible uh, to explain your methods, the what's going on in the process, how this process works. People don't imagine. I certainly didn't 
the depth uh, and detail that's involved in your uh, your systematic analysis of moves and players. Most people I've been seeing online and posting just basically when they do a computer analysis, like, yeah, I did all of the moves and these are the amount of moves that deviate from the top move and it's in the top three and maybe it's like 0. point this and the overall average was 0. 0.12 pawns or whatever. And it's very clear that you're way beyond that. That's just, you know, it's, it's scientific You're looking at the method. rear view mirror and just going. That, that's it's it's the scientific method, including controls and context, comparison data, all needs to be followed. 